It's 1986, Newark, and Michael Morrison is offered the opportunity of a lifetime. A new job, a fresh start with a secure future as a cop. But Mike has no idea he's about to join what he calls the biggest gang in America. I'm Saren Jones, and this is Black and Blue, Behind the Badge, a story about what happens when you have to pick a side. Follow Black and Blue, Behind the Badge, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. Do you ever spend too much time looking at the news or too long feeling bad while scrolling through social media? And maybe you wish the sun would just fry us all back to the Stone Age. Well, I have good news and bad news. The good news is, yes, at some point, a massive solar storm will hit the Earth, doing an incredible amount of damage to potentially our entire electrical grid, which of course powers everything. The bad news, though, the damage won't be permanent. Okay, fine. I guess if you're a less cynical person, I probably have the good and bad sides of that mixed up. But both things are still true. Solar storms happen all the time. And eventually, one of them will be truly gigantic. Those kinds of storms have happened before. We were just nowhere near as reliant on electricity and connectivity when they did. Right now, we're actively working on ways to detect these storms early to give us time to prepare. But even then, we're talking about giving us a few hours rather than a few minutes. Finally, we don't actually know how bad the damage would be or how long it would last. You see, we've never actually unplugged or fried our entire grid before and then tried to turn it back on. Maybe we should before it's too late. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Christopher Mims is a technology columnist for The Wall Street Journal. Hey, Christopher. Hello. Is it weird that with everything going on in the world these days, I read your column about solar flares sending us back to the Stone Age and thought it might be good news? No, I don't think that's weird at all. It's every it's my reaction every time somebody frets about uh, population decline. <laughs> One day, it won't matter at all. <laughs> or less. Listen, before we get started, uh, because this is really a, a fascinating science and tech story, so I, I don't mean to joke about it, but maybe you could start by telling us about uh, solar flares and solar storms and, and what they are, and in particular, the kind of storm we're concerned with today. So our sun is just this remarkably temperamental beast. We're just not aware of it because when it does weird stuff, generally we're not in the path of it. But the sun frequently has these eruptions and there are different kinds. There are solar flares, which is actually a burst of x-rays shooting uh, out from the sun. And then there are solar storms, where scientists call them coronal mass ejections, but I just call them solar storms. And that's when the sun spits out an actual bubble of charged particles, plasma, which is, of course, what the sun is made out of. How much do these storms vary in strength, and how often do they occur? These storms vary a great deal in strength. Think of it like any other kind of weather, right? Sometimes there's a breeze. Sometimes there's a class 5 hurricane. The intensity of the storm just describes how dense the particles are that are being shot at us. And because they're charged particles, the more of them there are, Uh, the bigger an effect they have on the Earth. Some of these solar storms are truly massive, though. I mean, it can be a bubble of plasma that is in dimensions, you know, a quarter of the distance between the Earth and the sun. And, you know, to put that in perspective, that's a distance that takes light eight minutes to travel. Let's talk about the mild or moderate ones first, just because I'm curious, you know, would we ever notice those here on Earth? And, and how would we experience like a, a very mild solar storm or a moderate one in our daily lives? This isn't conclusive, but there is some preliminary research which suggests that we are experiencing solar storms all the time. Huh. That the variable flux of, you know, electromagnetic energy from the sun is constantly affecting, really, our long-distance power grid and affecting how it functions, 
to a small enough degree that we don't notice. You know, big solar storms, though, mm, those are coming along maybe every 60 to 150 years, depending on how you define that. But, you know, smaller solar storms will brush past Earth or, or even hit Earth all the time, every couple of years, you know, maybe only months apart. Let's talk about the big one then. What kind of power are we talking about when we talk about those rare, large solar storms? And what might that do to us if one happened in our current, I guess, uh, technology-reliant climate as opposed to 100 years ago? When people talk about the total energy of one of these really big solar storms, you know, they talk about it in these almost absurd-sounding terms. It's like tens of thousands of nuclear bombs worth of energy, which sounds really bad. It sounds like the Earth is just going to be burned to a crisp. But that's just so big because it's, it's such a huge volume of charged particles, you know, passing by the Earth. What really matters is that that represents a shift in the sun's magnetic field, which is interacting with the Earth's magnetic field. And, you know, as anybody remembers from just a basic science class, when you, when you rub a magnet over a, let's say, a copper wire, you can make a light bulb light up. Mm-hmm. This basic principle, the relationship between magnetism and the movement of electrons or electricity, when that happens, it's, it's like the giant sun magnet is, is rubbing all of the long-distance power lines on Earth. And so that can cause these really large fluxes in our power grid. And as you probably know, in 1989, that knocked out power in the province of Quebec for something like nine hours because it tripped these safety mechanisms on these really big transformers designed to keep the grid safe. People are worried that if a storm that big hit and some part of the, especially the North American power grid weren't ready, that it could do serious damage that could take days or weeks to repair. When we say fry the grid, uh, as you did in your piece, what actually happens there? If you just imagine it, just a huge flux of electrical energy, you know, it's just like a surge on the grid. And the worry is that this either trips these safety mechanisms, which are designed to keep the really large transformers in the grid, which are there only a few dozen, from essentially blowing up. Some in the past have been worried that there could be a flux so big that it would damage these really giant transformers, which would take weeks or months to replace. How widespread would the damage from, and I guess this depends on the size of the storm, obviously, but, you know, beyond simple power lines, what else could it fry? So a really big solar storm endangers the, starting with the larger and larger portions of our infrastructure that are actually in space. So if you think about the potential to damage GPS satellites, or maybe you get your internet from satellite, or you're relying on something like Starlink, uh, or maybe your cell service is actually being routed through space and you don't even know it. You think you're just collect, connecting to a local cell tower. So all that space infrastructure is vulnerable in different ways. And then, of course, below the oceans, we have these very long distance fiber optic cables, which are the sort of real physical substance of the global internet. Those have an electrical wire in them as well which powers these repeaters, which have to boost the signal to get it all the way across the oceans, those could get knocked out as well. I mean, there was a paper from Google saying, you know, these once every maybe 100 year events wouldn't quite be enough to knock these out. But there are even bigger events. There are these events that happen once a millennium. And we know this from certain types of fossil records, actually, that you can have these super giant solar storms. So far, we've talked about it in terms of large-scale infrastructure. But in your piece, you also kind of described a little bit of what the aftermath of one of these storms would look like to a person just walking around. Can you help us understand how how we'd experience it if uh, one of these once-in-a-lifetime, I feel like we've said that for a lot of storms recently, but once-in-a-lifetime storms happened? Yeah, obviously, if power gets knocked out in an area for a substantial length of time, it's pretty disastrous because you can't, you know, you, you can't take care of wastewater. So your sewer system breaks down. You can't produce or pump clean water. So eventually that runs out. Obviously, there's no electricity to your house. Eventually, the, the backup batteries that run cell towers run out. So you could lose power. You could lose internet. You could lose, you know, the cold chain, which supplies your local grocery store with uh, food and, and keeps it fresh. <laughs> 
So, I mean, that's that's pretty disastrous. I mean, that's why people talk about maybe you get kind of get knocked back to the Stone Age with some of these really big potential storms. You know, experts say, we don't know, right? We don't know what would get knocked out when right. and to what degree. Do we know uh, when one might be coming? You've kind of mentioned a couple times, like, you know, the, the, there are periods of time in which we might expect them. But do we have any way to detect them when they happen? Solar storms are not like, for example, earthquakes, where, you know, the tension is constantly building up and eventually it's, it's something's got to give. So you can, in a very real sense, say, oh, we're overdue, you know, for a quake on this fault. Right. They're pretty random. And, and part of that is we just don't know enough about how the sun works. Part of that is that the sun is just very hard to model. It's just enormously complicated. And the other part of it is there's this kind of Russian roulette dumb luck element where the sun, you know, is constantly having these emissions, these solar storms. And we don't know it because they just, they go right past us or they're on the other side of the sun. Mm. I mean, not that long ago, within the last couple of years, a gigantic solar storm missed the Earth by a week. We only know about this because there happened to be a space probe that was in its path. What would we do if we did have notice that these were coming? I keep thinking about the old advice uh, before we had these surge protectors to, like, unplug your computer and your television in a, in a serious thunderstorm. People have said that, you know, a simple way to deal with one of these if it's on its way is just to turn off all the electronics, right? But I'm a little skeptical that that would be a solution that, for example, grid operators would resort to because it's not like we've ever... When was the last time we had a drill where they're like, let's shut down the entire grid so we <laughs> know what that's it. like. Let's just see what happens. Let's see if how long it takes us to bring the grid back up. A lot of the preparation consists of, you know, making sure these systems are kind of solar storm proof in the first place. So when I've talked to folks who put satellites way far away from Earth in so-called geostationary orbit, that's a pretty vulnerable place because you're, you're way outside of Earth's protective magnetic field. And those companies are like, look, we've been putting satellites up for 60 years, we definitely know how to give them protection against these kinds of big storms by now. Are we getting better at predicting them? Are we working towards getting better at predicting them? And I guess getting better at predicting threats coming from further away in space in general. The Space Weather Prediction Center, which is part of... I love that that exists. Right? It, it, and it's existed for a while. It's, it's part of NOAA, which of course supplies all the you know, space-based weather data to the National Weather Service in the U.S., which people use all over the world. They have said that they that their prediction abilities have gone up to seven hours notice, which is huge. It used to be only an hour or 30 minutes. Technically, they're not really predicting that something is happening. They just have, there are these probes that sit between Earth and the sun. And when a big solar storm hits one, then the probe is like, hey, there's one of these coming. You know, you've got, depending on how fast it's moving, a few hours notice or as little as 30 minutes. By looking at sort of the leading edge of these storms, they are predicting them further in advance. There are other efforts to put probes even farther out in space and kind of look at the Earth and the sun in profile and maybe detect these storms even earlier. What do we know about how long it could take us to recover from a really bad one of these storms, how long parts of North America or parts of the world would be knocked back to the Stone Age or whatever we want to call it. Like, this is something we've never, as you mentioned, we've never tried just shutting down the grid and turning it back on to see how long it would take us. I think the answer to that question is, is the same sort of in spirit as any intelligent person's answer would have been to, what do you think is going to happen if we get struck by a global pandemic? You know, hmm. but you asked in 2019. It's, it's such a big thing with so many unpredictable variables that it's really hard to know. And, you know, on the extreme side, you've had people say, if this takes out a certain number of really big critical transformers, you could have parts of the grid knocked out for months or more. You know, other folks have said, no, you know, we're, we're aware of that threat. We've updated the electronics that govern those parts of the grid. Like, we're more prepared than that. Like, we don't think there would be any interruption. So it really depends on what gets knocked out, right? If a GPS satellite or 10 gets knocked out, you might have intermittent GPS service until they can replace those satellites. You know, if a major undersea cable gets knocked out, maybe we have enough backup 
to reroute that traffic. But, you know, if you're Iceland, let's say, and one or two of your critical cables gets knocked out, maybe a whole country is without internet until they can replace that cable. If there's one thing I've learned from the pandemic, it's to definitely trust the reports that tell us how prepared we are for it. Yeah, I have to say that living through that was a major inspiration for me reporting out what would happen if there was a major solar storm. If this is going to happen sooner or later, because this is the way the sun works, shouldn't we practice for it and prepare for it by learning not to be so utterly reliant on these technologies? Like, we should maybe try to turn off the grid and turn it back on. I don't mean it like literally, but just as an exercise to make sure that not only are the systems resilient, but that we're resilient if the systems aren't there. I think I agree with that in broad strokes. I mean, a lot of what you want to do to prepare for getting power knocked out by a solar storm is what you should do to prepare for power getting knocked out by extreme weather. Mm -hmm. There's just growing evidence that there are multiple potential assaults on our modern society that we need to prepare for and be more resilient in the face of and have more backup systems and have simpler systems where the fail-safe isn't just that we're all like helpless infants the moment that it happens. This is more of a, I don't know if it's even a, a whimsical question or not, but there is a kind of allure to realizing all at once how dependent we've become on this technology and on our electronics and and having to cope without that for a while. I realize there are a ton of problems that this would cause that would have like serious health impacts. But there's there's really like, it's kind of attractive, no? <laughs> you can disagree for sure. <laughs> I don't think I find it in any way attractive. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Well, when I talk about the allure of that thing, too, you have to understand a lot of the listeners to this program, as well as the people who make it, are in Toronto. And I don't know if you remember the gigantic blackout of 2003, which basically knocked out power all along the Northeast. And the city of Toronto, honestly not known for being super friendly, perhaps had its friendliest night ever, which I think is where that came from. Oh, that's delightful. Yeah, I guess as an American, I just imagine something more like The Purge. <laughs> That's, that's exactly the answer I would expect from an American. <laughs> the reality is, is if the blackout had lasted longer than like 12 hours, it probably would have begun to turn into the purge, no matter where we were, right? <laughs> yeah, perhaps. Last question then. Did reporting this story out make you feel better or worse about how prepared we are both to predict this stuff and to cope with it if it happens? Reporting this story was ultimately uplifting for me because we're so often talking about existential threats to humanity, climate change, you know, misinformation, just our sort of unconquerable greed and vanity as a species. But this is one thing where you talk to the people involved and they're like, yeah, we have a plan or we actually know what to do and thoughtful people are working on it. And it's just been so long since We've been faced with an existential threat where it felt like people were actually doing the right thing about it. Christopher, thank you so much for this. It's fascinating. I don't mean to make light of it, but got to make light of something these days. <laughs> yeah, if we got to make light of anything, any existential threat, I think it's this one. Christopher Mims from The Wall Street Journal. That was the big story. And if you're listening to this podcast, that means I'm still waiting for that storm. You can find The Big Story everywhere you get your podcasts. If you want to talk to us, and we do love feedback or story requests, you can do so by finding us on Twitter at the Big Story FPN, or emailing us, hello, at thebigstorypodcast.ca, or by calling us and leaving a voicemail. That number is 416-935-5935. Joseph Fish is the lead producer of The Big Story. Robin Simon is a producer. This week, Christian Prohome and Christy Chan handled our sound design. Stephanie Phillips is our showrunner. Mary Jubrin is our digital editor. Diana Kay is our business manager. I'm your host and executive producer, Jordan Heath-Rawlings. Thanks for listening. Have a great weekend. We'll talk Monday.